Hello everyone, hola. Welcome to Software Architecture Monday. Uh, my name is Mark Richards. In this lesson number 136, we'll talk about techniques for controlling shared database changes, um, particularly within a distributed architecture. You can find a list of all of my lessons, especially if this is the first time you're seeing one, uh, on my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons, what I like to call Software Architecture Monday. Uh, here you can play the uh, videos, which are only about usually 10 minutes, directly from my website, or you can watch them on YouTube as well. Now, most of the material uh, comes from two books I wrote with my friend Neil Ford, uh, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, and software architecture, the hard parts, really good references for a more detailed information and extended information about some of the material I cover um, in Software Architecture Monday. In this lesson, I wanna talk about controlling database change. As a matter of fact, we've already seen two lessons um, that are related uh, to this one. Uh, the first was lesson 75. I talked about microservices data services. This is a kind of microservice that acts as a DAL, in other words, a data abstraction layer, uh, so that services needing to share data go through a single service. Uh, it helps control change because all of the data access is specifically within a single specialized data service as opposed to all of the services needing that data. So if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to look at that lesson to see how it works, but also the pros and cons. <laughs> well, I'm gonna show you how to control change in another architecture style, a distributed architecture that does use shared data, and that happens to be service-based architecture. I did do a lesson 114 where I did outline the differences between microservices and uh, service-based. And so you can take a look at that video to get more of a sense of what service-based architecture is. Uh, but with service-based architecture, we do have a user interface, which usually is, by the way, broken up, but here I'm showing it unified. Um, but we have domain services, as I alluded to in a prior lesson. I believe it was 134 where we did talk about services. Here, all of these services are sharing the same data. Uh, this is very convenient as an architecture style because unlike microservices, oh, we're not required to break apart our monolithic data. And that is a good thumbs up until we change that data. How do we control change across all of the domain services that are using that data? Now, let me show you a technique I typically use. As a matter of fact, I want to show you where the problem is first and then kind of a technique uh, to really help mitigate the problems of database change when you're sharing a database. You see, usually, um, and we'll talk about relational databases here for a minute, um, usually we have a, a schema uh, within that database and that schema contains tables. Then we have objects, usually called entities, depending on the language you're using, uh, that represent those particular tables. And those class files marked as entities usually go into a custom library. Uh, let's say a jar or a DLL here, I'm calling, about, I'm calling it the db underscore model dot jar. Uh, this shared library, uh, this jar file, contains all of the entity objects representing that schema. Okay, this is pretty typical. As a matter of fact, this exists largely in our monolithic applications. And when we move to distributed, uh, we kind of keep that same model. And this is where we have problems because any change made to that database, a, a, a column name, a column type, a table name, we drop a column, uh, these sort of breaking changes uh, require changes to all of my domain services. Now, you might say, but we could use versioning. I tend not to leverage versioning much here. I always version still to provide that backwards compatibility, but then we start getting inconsistencies uh, regarding the data and the representation of that data as objects. And so uh, consequently, the problem is we're not sure who uses that data because everybody's got the same jar file here or DLL. So let me show you a technique that I typically use in service-based architecture. And it's all about logical database partitioning. Now, the key here is this word, logical. 
We're not physically breaking our database apart. We're doing logical partitioning, which no DBA or person in the world can keep you from doing. Because <laughs> all we're doing is really looking at the various domains within the data. And here's what we start to find. We find common tables that all services need. And so what we do is take that as a particular domain and we create a common underscore model dot DLL or jar in this particular case that includes all those entities that represent those tables. Now, this is a lot of times unavoidable, especially for very common tables like an audit table, for example, or a primary customer table that everybody needs. Um, however, uh, we try to control change within that specific domain. But now we continue to partition this and we find that we've got some customer related tables. So we put those in a shared library. Well, which services need those? And it turns out only the first and the third ones do. In other words, the second and fourth services here actually do not need uh, any of those customer tables. There's no SQL or anything uh, involved with that, those tables. Then we start petitioning further and we say, well, we've got a group here of invoicing tables. Well, who needs those? And notice it's only the second service component, which is obviously our invoicing service. And so that representation of those tables, those entities get packaged up into there. And we continue to partition, like for example, orders. What I typically do is to try to partition, logically partition my data into domains that are fine-grained enough to where we start getting these one-to-one -one correspondence, but not so fine-grained that all of a sudden I'm stretching those out now between multiple services. The advantage of this technique of logical data partitioning is I've got all these domain-based entity libraries now, whether they be jars or DLLs, that now help me control change. Let's say I make a change to one of the invoice tables. Correspondingly, those invoice tables belong to a domain that is represented and manifested through a particular library. So this group of tables is invoice model.jar. Now, based on that mapping, I say which service uses invoice model.jar? And as a matter of fact, the cool thing is I can automate most of this based on some of our, our build and deployment scripts. And I find out the invoicing service is the only one that uses any of those tables. How do I know that? Because it's the only one containing those entities. So now I change a table, I change the corresponding entity inside that invoice model.jar, and that's the only service. I need to change. As a matter of fact, I don't need to retest or redeploy any of the other services. Uh, this is kind of a cool technique, uh, which isn't overly expensive. It does require some mappings between tables and the corresponding shared library of which those entities do reside. And so uh, that is most of the effort involved with this technique. But it does really help us control change uh, within a distributed architecture, especially when we're sharing data. So I hope you find this technique useful and hopefully you can use it at some point in uh, your journey. Um, in any case, thank you so much for listening. This has been Lesson 136, Controlling Shared Database Changes. Uh, stay tuned in two more weeks for another lesson in Software Architecture Monday. Thanks.